Welcome back viewers to this uh, exciting edition of uh, Focus on Africans. Today we've moved away from Amsterdam, we're in the, the NAC, called the Egg in English. This is the seat of the Dutch government. And today we have a very interesting personality, a former minister of the Dutch government, who was also involved with uh, the United Nations, a lot of agencies, the World Bank. And also he was the special representative of the United Nations Secretary General to Sudan. And uh, yeah, he has a lot of uh, interesting ideas. He was not uh, only a politician, but a very principled one, very unusual politician. And uh, yeah, as we're going to learn from him, he has a lot of, uh, he's a, a development uh, expert. He was also a, a minister of the environment. So we're going to touch on this issue, on this edition of Focus on Africa. Let me welcome uh, Mr. Ian Prong to Focus on Africa. Please, welcome. Thank you. You're welcome here. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for granting us this interview. We consider it a privilege, really, to have you on this, uh, on our program. As again, you are welcome. Thank yeah. you very much. Please, uh, who is, um, who is Jan Prong? Can you tell us something about yourself? Jan Prong? I'm Dutch. Yeah. And at the moment, we are here at the Institute of Social Studies, mm -hmm. which is a university institute uh, only for students coming from developing countries. Yeah. Not big not a big institute. We have about 400 students per annum, mm -hmm. quite a number from Africa, and indeed also quite a number from uh, from Ghana. Okay. Well, can we talk about your background? Uh, where, did you, where were you Yeah, born? but I, I like to, to talk about today, not about yesterday. Yes, huh? yes, but uh, I have a long background because okay, I'm already 70 years old at the moment. Uh, for the benefit of our viewers in Ghana. Sure. So, okay, so, uh, uh, where were you born? I'm Yes, I was born here in, in the Hague. As a matter of fact, it's Scheveningen, okay. which is uh, a seaside resort and a fishing resort. Uh, mm -hmm. My grandfather was a fisherman and my oh. father was a teacher. Okay. And I studied economics at the university yes. in Rotterdam oh, okay. with a very well-known international economist, uh, which perhaps you may have heard of, uh, Jan, Jan Tinbergen. He was the first... Nobel Prize winner in economics in the, the 1960s, the first one, together with mm -hmm. uh, a Norwegian, Mr. Frisch. Okay. And as a matter of fact, um, I was working with him mm -hmm. in his team. I, after I finished my studies in economics, he asked me to join okay. his team as a, as a scientist. And I uh, was able to work with him for about seven years, and then I went into politics. Okay. I'm, and I was going to ask you, what does it, uh, working with such a brilliant fellow, what, uh, oh, it's a what do you remember teacher. from It's a great me? teacher. He was the economist here who taught us development yeah. on the basis of programming, planning. You have to set objectives. Systematic. It's very systematic model building. Okay. You have to set objectives, targets, and to use specific instruments in a coordinated fashion. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. he had won that Nobel Prize in economics on the basis of his work in the 1930s, oh, yeah? which was the crisis in the North, unemployment, business cycle fluctuations, Depres depression, and depression. He worked also together with Keynes, who was yeah. another okay. world-renowned economist. And on the basis of his methods, yeah. after the Second World War, mm -hmm. he said, I now want to apply my methods to the big problem of today, which is no longer the recession yeah. of the North, but which is inequality and poverty in the South. So he became a planner of development. Okay in developing countries, for developing and he was teaching, he was also at the university and he was an advisor to many developing countries. He taught me development economics. Without him, I would never have entered that field. Yeah. What were you doing actually with him then? Were you developing models with him? Or? Yes, uh, quantitative uh, statistical econometric models, Ooh, which, is, which is a bit difficult. It's very scholarly. Uh, yeah, I was a scholar mm -hmm. uh, by again a scholar at the moment, mm -hmm. but you may say uh, that we economists yeah. in the 1970s, 80s and 90s have become too much focused on models, okay. because a model is a set of relations mm -hmm. yeah. which you can quantify, mm -hmm. and everything which you cannot quantify mm -hmm. does not exist in the view of such so mathematically oriented economy, which means that for instance, and I learned it the hard way, okay culture, 
is not part of your model because it's difficult to quantify power is also difficult to quantify but those things you discover later yes i would say so but you have to learn it by doing by applying you make a plan and you come to the conclusion that the implementation of the plan is more important than the plan which means that policy is more important than planning so i became quite interested in policy making and then you become interested in politics that leads me directly to the next question you from academic you went to politics i was going to ask you what was the attraction um as a matter of fact development policy making always has been quite an important issue in foreign policy making in the Netherlands. Okay. I was a labor politician, the labor yeah, party. The party. And the spokesperson for development issues, development aid for instance, yeah. he died in the 1960s and people asked me, wouldn't you be interested in okay. uh, run for parliament? I was not so much interested at the time in politics, mm -hmm. but in when development. Policy because policy. they could combine yeah. it and so I said wait why not okay. and I became the spokesperson the new spokesperson for, the, uh, for my party. party which was a big party mm -hmm. in 1971 and uh, two years later all of a sudden everything was changing in Holland because you had the, the revolution of the no left you, uh, you may know yeah, that in many more. countries uh, so I belonged to that group Mm -hmm. So I became all of a sudden a minister yeah. in 1973. Uh, for for Dutch yeah. criteria, it was at a rather young age. Yeah, so not for African criteria, by the way, but for then? Dutch criteria. Uh, so how old were you then? Were you becoming a minister? Uh, 33. 33. Okay. 33. And I. Um, I, I was the Minister for International Cooperation in the period of the new International Economic Order. You remember yeah. those negotiations mm -hmm. in the 1970s uh, during uh, that period. Okay. The question now is, uh, you come from this academic, you went to a progressive uh, political party. What informed that decision? You could have joined another right-wing uh, politics. What is Tim Bergen was quite important. Okay. He was a teacher. He was a progressive teacher. And for me, he, he was himself a labor-oriented okay. uh, scientist. He was a big influence on you. Oh yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. But to choose for social democracy, because that is what it is, mm -hmm. for me always has been based on two set of considerations. First, I would say ethical, okay. yes? inequality, poverty, underclass, mm -hmm. it is something which you should not allow uh, to in continue any society. in any society, not only in Holland, in Europe, mm -hmm. in the world. Secondly, you have to do it in one way or another, uh, you have to do it systematically. Okay. And that means that there is also a kind of a rational choice in favor of social democracy, which is not capitalism, definitely, because capitalism is leading to inequality, yeah. to economic power, which is not being Cons controlled. Yeah. Huh? Uh, but of course, you cannot go for an authoritarian, yeah, no. totalitarian well, that's uh, a regime. That's a, that's a and that means that, yes, mm -hmm. sometimes you could say the third way. I don't like the terminology mm -hmm. third way because now it has become a bit... Uh, Blair oriented, uh, but anyway, social democracy yeah. is not all authoritarian, it's democratic, okay. it is not market oriented yeah. because it is social. Okay, how do you answer those who say that uh, inequality is a natural process? I mean, uh, what they call social Darwinism. Why is it uh, in the point that you have uh, social equality? Two reasons mm -hmm. I would say there is no society mm -hmm. nowhere which in the long run can continue being stable and continue to exist if there is too much inequality because people are not going to accept it and then they will revolt they will attack the system and then the system will not be able to 
bear the consequences of inequality, which is a rational thing. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is also an ethical thing, because inequality is not just inequality, mm-hmm. it, means it means poverty. It means poverty. And it means that the rich or the middle class, okay. for me the middle class is always a very important factor in political development, are just continuing to think about themselves yes, yeah. and are depriving the others, and they get poorer and poorer. So these two regions, the rational one and the ethical one. And the ethical one. But um, why is this uh, so, s- uh, the way you analyze it, it looks so simple. Why is the fact escaping uh, because the of power. Because of power. Because so you have power to, um, to bring power into the game. But in the long run, the power also is not sustainable because it lacks a basis. In the la- uh, base. Because the people will revolt eventually, according to your analysis, what is it also in their interest or self-interest? So yeah. to promote uh, in the long run, there is a self-interest in sustainability, in mm-hmm. stability. Mm-hmm. There is a long-term self-interest of everybody, yeah. also belonging to the richer classes, mm-hmm. uh, to have uh, stability and less inequality. As a matter of fact, that is also economic history. We had a lot of inequality and poverty in Europe yeah. in the 19th century. Deprivation Mm -hmm. of poor people, long labor hours, low pay, Mm -hmm. which was not wise. Finally, the richer people and the entrepreneurs concluded because they can let the poor people work, but Mm -hmm. they have to buy the products. So you have to add purchasing power also. So less inequality is also in the interest of the middle class and of the richer people. But you have to learn that Mm -hmm. through history. As a matter of fact, you can also apply that at the world scale. Yeah, that's but uh, at the world scale, it has not yet been accepted, maybe, and that's my t- theory, because there are still so many people belonging to the middle class mm-hmm. in the world that there is enough possibility to and sell, uh, not only around the corner within your own national society, but yeah. also because of globalization, mm-hmm. Far away. There is no far away anymore. No anymore yeah. The world middle class does consist, consist together with the upper classes, of about, I would say, four billion people, people. So and the other class market. about two million, two billion. Mm-hmm. And that means that the realization that it is not sustainable mm-hmm. is being postponed. I mean, we have the problem now. Let's take the example of the Netherlands. Uh, 20 t- uh, no, 30 years ago, it was the equality, the inequality was much more less. So he said, uh, t- uh, maybe I'm wrong, but in my estimation, the inequalities, uh, the gap between the ups and the ups not. Now, I used to, I uh, was in Amsterdam, I saw people really in poverty. Yeah. And uh, 30 years ago, I never see people in this country who are really in... Uh, You're quite right. Yeah. Uh, so, um, was what went on? After the Second World War, yes. in... All countries, the reconstruction yeah. went together with the reconstruction also of society, which meant the building of a social welfare state. Yes. Mm-hmm. A social welfare state meant quite some income redistribution yes. from middle classes and richer mm-hmm. people to poorer people mm-hmm. on the basis of these two considerations, rational thought mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. ethics. Mm-hmm. To be spent on health, mm-hmm. on education, education yeah. employment creation, good housing, mm-hmm. etc. Yes. Yes. All around the world, not only in Holland, mm-hmm. all around the world, after 1980, inequality increased again. All statistical in- index is, numbers yeah. um, within countries and also between um, countries, countries, in all countries, in the US, European countries, also many developing countries. Mm-hmm are showing an increase in inequality. Mm-hmm. To a certain extent, that is due to, what I said, globalization. globalization. Yes? Okay. Um, because people do not need mm-hmm. the underclass anymore. Yes? To a certain extent, it is also just a cultural reaction on the mainstream thinking of a previous generation. Okay. I see circles, waves, mm-hmm. in acceptability of some specific views. Mm-hmm. And those waves, I would say, last 40 years. Um, uh, and so we have seen since 1980, mm-hmm. everywhere, an increase in inequality and a stagnation in poverty reduction. Poverty. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, you were former. You first be, uh, started as an MP, member of parliament. Then you became a minister. What are the differences you see in uh, making laws and implementing uh, policies? We have a, um, a dualistic parliamentary uh, representative system mm -hmm. here. So I was an MP, I became a minister, but mm -hmm. uh, you have to uh, get the acceptance of parliament for any law. You cannot just take a decision. Mm -hmm. uh, you can only take decisions with regard to the implementation of laws. Mm -hmm. So it was at that time not so easy because we had a kind of a leftist minority government okay. to get everything no. being accepted by parliament. It was a very interesting political period because of the left and the young, okay. uh, new views Idealistic. on the future of society. Yeah, to a great extent idealism mm -hmm. um, with regard to environment, mm -hmm. position of women, okay. but also cultural issues. Um, I give one example which is perhaps uh, for us that was important. Um, the acceptance of abortion. Okay, mm -hmm. that which, was a big issue in those days. Which was a very big issue, um, because the women said, we are master of our own, own belly, <laughs> our own body, our own belly even. Mm -hmm. It's not you, male, who have to decide whether we want to have a child or not. Right. Which became a very political issue, because mm -hmm. the traditional groups, and I, I myself, I'm a Christian, mm -hmm. I'm coming from a rather traditional Christian mm -hmm. church, mm -hmm. they were not in favor. Uh, the Catholics were very much against, mm -hmm. uh, also Protestant. So it was quite a fight. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a combination of economic policies mm -hmm. in favor of more equality, mm -hmm. uh, democratization, new issues, mm -hmm. uh, which made that period very interesting in, in, in many, many Western European countries, oh, okay. uh, by the way. Mm -hmm. It was at the same time also the fight for decolonization, yeah, uh -huh. of course. Mm -hmm. uh, we had all these groups in, all of the in favor of uh, anti-Portugal, anti-NATO, uh, liberation anti of Angola, and of course also Vietnam, mm -hmm. huh? yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, South uh, Africa. Okay. Your first uh, substantive uh, portfolio was uh, development, yeah. development corporation. Yeah. What is development? Development for me is something which has to be defined by the people in the country itself. You cannot define it from outside. So I define development yeah. in my classes, in my students, as firstly change, but not all change is development. So change has to be combined with improvement. Yes. Qualitative improvement. Yes, but improvement, who decides whether there is improvement? It has to be decided by the people within a society itself. By any time more people, mm -hmm. yes, not just by leaders, okay, by not just by minorities. So it is change mm -hmm. for the better, mm -hmm. perceived by many, many more people. Mm -hmm. So it is not me who decides the whether the there consumers. is development in Africa, yes, the is Africans, yes. And if Africans think that some things are more important than we Europeans think mm -hmm. that are important, the Africans so are right, that, uh, and we are wrong. And that is also important for the thinking of international organizations, organizations. World Bank, yeah, etc. Um, during your tenure, you increased the Dutch uh, development aid Yes. Was that a big fight? Was that a revolution? Yes, it was quite a fight. Uh, it was, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, Jan Tinberg, and the person mm -hmm. who I mentioned, who was chairman of a United Nations committee mm -hmm. in 1960, preparing a plan for the world, the yeah. first development decade. Global plan. Global plan for the world mm -hmm. as a whole. Uh, requested, of course, by the United Nations okay. and adopted that plan by all countries in the General Assembly in 1960. Okay. And one of the elements of the plan was international financing mechanism. Mm -hmm. And that meant that in order to enable developing countries to together mm -hmm. to reach a certain growth rate, an economic growth Those, rate, 7%, yeah. that was the target, Annually, you needed also international assistance on top of their own mm, uh, investment efforts, and yeah. savings. Mm. And the, the amount of international assistance mm -hmm. in order to top up domestic savings mm -hmm. was in percentage of, of the rich digital, countries, digital. 1%. It was a calculation, that was not just a thought, a calculation. Yeah. 
1% of the uh, national income later on, on the basis of a new calculation method, became 0.7% of GNP. Okay. It's exactly the same, but it's a new statistical But you increased way. the deduction. And we were able to increase it because that was the promise. And we didn't have it. We, did, we had it at about 0.3% mm -hmm. uh, before I became a minister. Mm -hmm. I was able because we, it was our commitment mm -hmm. to increase it to 0.7. As a matter of fact, in the 90s, 90s when I was a minister again, mm -hmm. I was able to make it 0.8, it's still 0.8, which is right. remarkable, it's a political issue, it's mm -hmm. remarkable, because only four countries have been able to keep it at that level, which is Sweden, the Netherlands, Norway, Denmark and the Netherlands, four, four countries, countries only. Oh, okay. yeah. And from the perspective of the South, there are many advocates of uh, fiat trade. I mean, making the yes. level, the field, the plain le field level. Yeah. Instead of uh, aid, the advocate yes. the aid. Yes. I know that. Already in the 1950s, the developing countries yeah. gradually more and more became independent Women. countries, members of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. They said trade not aid. Hmm? Trade not aid. Trade not aid. Yeah. Uh, which is a very clear position mm -hmm. because. If we have unfair trade relations, mm -hmm. we don't need aid yeah, to just yeah. to compensate yeah. a lack of ju economic justice. Mm -hmm. um, now, you also need assistance, mm -hmm. aid, mm -hmm. to top up your own domestic savings and your domestic investment mm -hmm. in order yeah. to produce. So you need both. Uh, you, but if you only get aid the idea, and not to produce yeah. and you cannot sell the products, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't help. Uh, if but if you are able to produce something, something uh, to, to, to sell something, but you can't produce it before you sell, sell it, it uh, doesn't help out. Uh, so uh, it is a combination of aid it. and trade. Okay. Um, I was going to ask, uh, give the example of uh, Ghana yeah. and the Cote d'Ivoire. These two countries produce uh, more than 50% of the world's cocoa. Yeah. If they are able to, sell, to determine the prices of their cocoa, for, sure. for example, yeah. why would they be needing it? In order to, sorry, the why, why would you like Ghana and require aid from the West? I mean. You, well, at a certain moment you don't need aid anymore. Yeah. Definitely not. And the whole idea of that plan, which I was just what mentioning, mentioned? was to make aid at a certain moment superfluous. superfluous. Because if you, it's an economic reasoning which I very easily can explain. Mm -hmm. If you top up something domestically, yeah. Then you can grow more than otherwise you could have done. If you grow more, you can also save more. Uh, so you don't need the assistance anymore. The quicker you grow mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. in the say the first 10 or 20 years, the quicker you so reach a situation whereby you don't need, need the aid anything. anymore. Yeah. Now many countries, mm -hmm. in my view, have reached such a situation. So however, however, two points. Firstly, there's still a lot of poverty, mm -hmm. despite growth. Mm -hmm. Now you can try to deal with your own poverty fully, mm -hmm. and I think that many developing countries ought to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but as long as they don't do it, mm -hmm. those poor people, and two billion, yeah, they, poor they poor. need some assistance okay. from outside. Secondly, um, there are a number of world problems which you cannot deal with anymore on the basis of just national uh, consideration. Say climate, or adjustment to climate change, mm -hmm. uh, as, as one very important example. Um, you need international yeah. transfers okay. from the one country, not only to the other country, but to international programs. Well, you are talking in terms of technology. So. Technology, but also the application of technology. Okay. If we continue mm -hmm. in Holland and in Europe mm -hmm. to spoil the atmosphere the by warming up, yeah. the you have problems in terms of agriculture, health, but yeah. also sea level rise uh, yeah. at coastal Before areas. Uh, you need the technology, mm -hmm. but also the investment mm -hmm. and the protection in order to apply that technology. And you need also international but, assistance uh, for that purpose. The problem I see here now is, uh, is it in the interest of the West to assist this country to become self, uh, yeah, uh, self-sufficient? If we take the case of uh, uh, the cocoa producing countries, and uh, so let's assume that Ghana has uh, yeah. determined the price of its cocoa, and it gets enough money, 
Of course, uh, the people have to pay the price. The Western uh, people in the West have to pay the price. Are, they are those prices that people are prepared to pay? For a number of uh, commodities, they are. Mm -hmm. uh, the commodities which uh, are part mm -hmm. of a consumption package uh, for middle class people, mm -hmm. uh, people are quite interested in paying higher prices. For, the uh, the for property chocolate. also will um, But for a number of other products, they are not. Um, um, the problem, of course, is mm -hmm. for cocoa mm -hmm. that you have to compete with other cocoa producers. Yes. yes? Yeah. So, and that is, you didn't mention the name of the organization yet, UNCTAD. Yes. UNCTAD yeah. We well, did have a there. period mm -hmm. uh, or in the 1970s and 1980s mm -hmm. during which many developing countries producing the same commodity mm -hmm. were trying to unite in order mm -hmm. to the be a strong partner on the market. Mm -hmm. you can, well, cartel is a negative formulation, but anyway, it is strong economic power. Okay. We were trying at that time to have international commodity agreements, mm -hmm. whereby between the producers mm -hmm. and the demanding countries, the importing countries, and agreements which would result in stable price, because one of the problems is the yeah, fluctuation, at a reasonable level, yes, mm -hmm. so that you would know more or less what you what would do. earn also next year and the next decade, which enables you to plan and mm -hmm. to invest and to use the money also for development purposes. Mm -hmm. It failed. Why? I have worked also within UNCTAD, uh, also with Ken Dazi, a very a famous uh, Canadian. Mm -hmm. He was uh, my boss, oh, I was yeah. the number two oh. of the organization at that Ken time. Um, on those international commodity agreements, mm -hmm. it, it failed because the demanding importing countries didn't allow the developing countries uh, to have those, yeah. uh, and they were playing divide mm -hmm. and rule. And as soon as you have right. one or two countries which are not willing to participate in the mm -hmm. cartel, yeah, it breaks down. And that's the question, uh, which is, of course, is the, the self-interest of the Western countries to get uh, this commodity as cheaply as possible. Let's give an example of uh, France and Niger. Yeah. 80% of uh, uh, French electricity are produced from uh, uranium from Ni yeah. Niger. Why would the French support a uh, situation where Niger would be demanding more money? No, of course. Uh, uh, countries yeah. and also consumers want to have low prices. Yes. And international trade has resulted in decrease of prices of many products. Uh, for instance, textile and garments. Yeah, that's uh, an, uh, leather. Definitely. That's an interest of consumers. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely so. Is that bad? I would say it is not bad in itself because it is also a boost to mass production. So you get more and more employment well, in many countries, okay. also in African countries, but more in Asian countries and in African countries. But some African countries have been able uh, to benefit, Botswana is an example, of, of more production at lower prices, mm -hmm. because there are many people, people buy the job. Now, your first question was a bit different. Are consumers willing to pay a higher price? price oh yes, sometimes consumers are willing to pay a higher price. If, this, if the product is good, Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. because just cheap is not good. Okay, yes, uh, very cheap shoes which are easily yeah, to be yeah, wear, yeah. worn and uh, no. And then consumers are willing to pay a higher chocolate. No, definitely, uh, are also. I was talking about the primary commodities, not the manufactured goods. No, okay, no, but cocoa. Yeah, cocoa. Yeah, co nobody is buying uh, eating cocoa. You yeah, eat yeah. a chocolate product. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So it's always any any. Con any primary commodity at a certain moment is being processed into a commodity bodies, which is yeah. being used. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're willing to pay a higher price for chocolate, mm -hmm. there will be less chocolate sure. products being sold. So you have to find a new well, equilibrium. Okay. Um, uh, but my advice would be for a country like Ghana and Ivory Coast, mm -hmm. go for the best. Because at the moment, huh, so high quality, yeah. high quality, and you have to fight also with a number of the oh, uh, produce. cocoa yeah. produced okay. in, in uh, countries. consuming countries, mm -hmm. real cocoa, not synthetic it's cocoa. cocoa. Huh? Okay. Viewers, uh, we'll take this short break. When we come back, we'll continue with uh, Mr. Yaprong for on this uh, interesting uh, subject. <laughs> Welcome back to 
back view, I said the program is still a focus on Africans, and today we are talking with Mr. Ian Prong, the former minister of uh, the Dutch government. And you have these progressive ideas, yeah. and then you are working with uh, institutions like uh, the World Bank, yeah. which whose program are very toxic. Sure, work, uh, definitely. So. And that's so why you, you try to influence policy making. But of course, the World Bank does consist of a board and a staff, yeah. and, and governments are in the board, mm. and, and Holland is part of the board. And I um, was in the, in the positive situation that not only the Minister of Finance was the member of the board, the board. but also the Minister of Development was a deputy, yeah, his deputy okay. representative. To, it meant that. Uh, we could influence the policies of the World Bank more in favor of development rather mm. than only in favor of st stability. Okay. I, I think in the 70s we were able to do so. Mm -hmm. um, in the 80s? At the, in the 80s I was well, no longer in politics, there, uh, but in the 70s I just want to, uh, to, uh, uh, to mention that. In the 70s you had McNamara. Yeah. And he was, became the president of the World Bank. And he became very much interested in small-scale agriculture, mm -hmm. in basic human needs uh, uh, provisions. Okay. And he changed the policies of the, the bank. bank. Uh, in the, and I was able to, uh, well, to, to support his policies in that period. Mm -hmm. In the 1980s, mm -hmm. after the world crisis, it was a debt mm -hmm. crisis, okay. which came to the world from Latin America, mm -hmm. The bank Not changed its policies together with the International Monetary Fund and every country had to adjust and adjust. Mm -hmm. I had left politics mm -hmm. uh, because my party was uh, beaten at the elections, the elections okay. um, and I went to UNCTAD. I became the Deputy Secretary mm -hmm. of UNCTAD. Mm -hmm. So we had very difficult discussions uh, between uh, UNCTAD and other United Nations organizations, including in particular the bank and the fund, in mm -hmm. order to tell them mm -hmm. you have to change your adjustment, adjustment policies. policies. So it was quite an intellectual and political debate within the United Nations at the time. You who, may say that was more or less over who, after the who end won of the, the Cold War. IMF won until every country had adjusted, so more or less, and uh, it petered out because of the end of the Cold War. Because the end of the Cold War meant, meant yeah. for the world.